Yeah, I'm a drummer, uh, East Tennessee. I uh, grew up playing bluegrass. I didn't really like, I, I like bluegrass and I like old country. Um, and I like, you know, Leuven Brothers and all, all the older stuff. But I just knew that it wasn't kind of my thing. I was laying out of school to get like heavy D 12 inches, you know? I just liked beats and sampling and, uh, you know, just rhythm. And um, country just wasn't my rhythm. <laughs> so I came to Nashville. It was country music town. So that was kind of painful. But just really growing up digging R&B, my brother was a virtuoso guitar player. He was into Dio. He was just like Mixolydian scales. So I would play drums with him and I got into rock bands and stuff and that was really fun. Uh, but when I moved here, there weren't a lot of drummers in town. And this is Murfreesboro. Yeah. The bur in the borough, or, or as um, John Mulaney calls it, Murfreesboro. <laughs> More about that later. There weren't a lot of drummers, so every night of the week you'd be playing a different type of music. You'd be doing, I played in like a punk rock trio, I played piano pop band, I played aux percussion in a reggae band. So you're getting all these flavors and just learning all these, these new things. You know, I started on a four track, which I just got a new four track. Um, but one of the, yeah, one of these task cams, uh, I was, that was my, I lived on it. And so I, I was very organized. I still kind of am, I guess. Organized by semester, you know? What? Just, yeah, summer. This one says, four track mix, June, July, 93, summer. Wow. <laughs> and I would make beats. So in my dorm room, when I got to college here, I went to school for music for recording. And um, I had a four track and I would make beats uh, for 50 bucks or whatever. Got a record deal when I got kicked out of recording school and um, started going to the studios in Nashville and working with like the best engineers and like the best rooms and um, doing it pro. And uh, it was clean, you know what I mean? It sounded like a Travis Tritt record as opposed to a grungy, dirty, you know, hairy thing. So I started buying gear. There used to be a, a store called Tuscal Music that you could get like, you know, an Alesis 3630 compressor for 30 bucks consignment. And you'd do it like layaway, <laughs> just pay, make payments on it. Um, so I started buying gear kind of out of necessity. Like I don't really enjoy, uh, I didn't enjoy engineering. I knew nothing about gear. I just knew that I needed it to make it sound better than this. So that's what I started doing. And anytime I got money, I would collect stuff and keep it. And it was out of like, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So that's what I did. And then I kind of did the, the Nashville Murfreesboro thing. We started a record label here in the 90s. Had some success, had some, we started a sound here, you know? We had our own vibe. I got another record deal uh, with a label that wasn't really uh, listening to my songs. They weren't really supporting what I was doing. Actually, they let me do whatever the hell I wanted to do, which was the problem. Because um, I was producing and writing and doing everything and, and they did, there was no rules. And uh, they just, it was DreamWorks had a record label, DreamWorks Records. And they were super cool and they just wanted vibey stuff. And I made an insane record uh, called Breakfast with Girls and spent a lot of money and had string sections and stuff. But then they didn't promote it, it didn't, didn't sell. So I was like, I'm gonna move to LA and move next door to them. And anytime I write a song, just drive over the hill and be like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And I did that for our next album, uh, which we did out there. And um, it didn't even come out. <laughs> and that's with like Rich Costi mixing. And, you know, we did it at, uh, what did I forget the name of it. Linda Perry owns it now. It's like uh, her place, but beautiful room. This was self, yes. Yeah, doing the songwriting thing, but they had an animation department and they had a film department. So anytime they'd have a new film, they would just kind of say like, come screen it. Because we'd like our artists to have the songs in their films. And so I'd go do that. And a lot of it was animation. And the first one was, uh, first movie that I screened was Shrek. And I wrote that on the 101 on the way home. And by the, net, by, by the weekend, I was like, I have a song for you. And I took it in, they were like, we love it. And so um, I was like, this is really cool. And I lost my record deal but they were hiring me to, I would just call them like, do you have any work? And they'd be like, well, we're doing like a companion CD that's karaoke songs to go with the Walmart only selling of Shrek. 
will you do those songs? And so I would do that. And then through that, they started giving me stuff to score, short films, uh, The Pig Who Cried Werewolf, uh, the Thriller video. Like Shrek became this thing that kind of kept giving. Oh, we're doing a theme park ride at Universal. Will you do, will you cover the Archie Sugar Sugar and score it or whatever? And so it was like, hell yeah. So I just kept doing that and then worked on Flushed Away and Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. And you know, I'm, next thing I know, I'm working with Hans Zimmer. And um, it's like this crazy idea that he had of making uh, everything electronic, like that band Yellow. Oh yeah, like that song. He's like, let's do an electronic soundtrack for this horse movie, because the horse doesn't talk. And uh, it didn't work. Um, but he liked what I did. And at the time, Brian Adams was gonna be narrating it. And then it switched over to like, oh, now Matt Damon's gonna narrate it and Brian Adams is gonna do all the songs. So go produce Brian Adams. So I was in there producing Brian Adams and it was awesome, it was really cool. Um, and I just kept, got, I, I realized that I liked working the picture and especially animation. So having something in front of me and it being silent and then just putting music underneath it, it's just like, at that moment, around that time, I don't know when it was, probably 2003, we had lost our record deal. I'd written hundreds of songs that you know no one's heard. And uh, I just kind of flipped. It was like, I, I think I'm gonna be, a, I think I'm a composer, you know? Because the self music, musicians really like it because it is all these ideas. It's like everything but the kitchen sink. It's all this crap. Um, that I'm cramming in, because I, I was at the mercy of a three and a half minute pop song. I'm like, but I want to do all this shit, and I, I couldn't, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I realized like, no, like if you're, if, you're, if you're scoring, you can take that stuff and you can stretch it all out. The jazz doesn't have to be on top of the hip hop, on top of the rock, on top of the prog, on top of the, you know, exotica. It can exist um, side by side. And it was like this aha moment of like, I still get to do all these disparate, cool things that I want to do, but I don't have to do it in this tiny little box. Yeah, so I've been scoring since then. Working for DreamWorks, I met people at Walt Disney and Nickelodeon. They were like, would you ever do episodic stuff? I was just game for whatever. And, I, and so I started doing it. I started writing songs for a uh, Dora the Explorer compatible show called Nihao Kai Lan. It was the uh, top Mandarin instead of Spanish. And I wrote the songs for that, and it was really fun. And um, then met people, and then next thing I know, I'm, I'm actually scoring. And you get your first show, you're staring at this thing, there's no music, you have a blank page, and you have a blank session. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, it's still kind of terrifying. But at least now I know how to get from point A to point B, and yeah. it's always different.